reading from the Act of the Apostles. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely, by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it was done in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. In his name, this man stands before you healed. He is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is a reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, see what the love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters the sheep. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know mine and mine know me. Just as the Father knows me and I Know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. So, you know how the days start, and some days you just have no idea about the wonderful thing that's going to happen before the day is out. Catches it completely by surprise. Not something that's on your bucket list, because, like, your bucket list wouldn't ever occur to put this thing on your bucket list. And so it was on Thursday afternoon of this week, I had gone down to a priest friend of mine who's not in great health, and I went down to take him out to dinner, and uh, on the way back, decided to stop to visit some friends. Why? There's a a wonderful, wonderful gal, 98 years old, her name is Evelyn, and she left for heaven uh, three weeks ago. And she was just a dear, dear friend in this piece of my life. Really, I mean, I get to see her probably once a week, if not more, 
and she kept odd hours, which was great, so I could go over there during the semester when school would be out, and it was always a lot, a lot of laughs. So she lived over at a, at a place in Woodbridge, St. Joseph's. Uh, it's both assisted living and a nursing home. Evelyn lived in the assisted living part, and she and another, uh, one of the nuns there and I, the three of us were just great friends and had great laughs. So when Evelyn died three weeks ago, I've been you know, kind of checking in and wanting to commiserate with my nun friend, dear, dear friend, Sister Lucy. And so on the way back from the priest dinner, I decided I think I better, I'm gonna stop in there. I could use a little bit of uh, uh, Evelyn chat right now. So I texted Sister Lucy and she had a half hour break um, on the nursing shift and she was going up to the house for a cup of tea and I met her up there and one of the other sisters was there and some of them were coming and going. So Sister Lucy says, what about a cup of tea? Great chamomile, sit down, have the thing, we're chatting away. And one of the other nuns comes in, a younger one. And sometimes it's because of the language skill and sometimes it's just because of, because. Um, sometimes when they're making suggestions, it comes across as a direct order, okay? <laughs> And I never question it. So Sister Magda, lovely, lovely young gal, uh, smart as could be, working on her uh, accounting degree and, doing, and working on youth ministry and 101 other things. She comes in and she has this big fat rope with her, big rope. She says, hold it and do not move. <laughs> okay, sister, I'm going to hold it and I'm not going to move, right? Now, mind you, these sisters are all in full habit, right? Top to bottom, blue habit. She walks us across to the other side of the kitchen and she like flashes into ninja nun mode with tug of war, okay? So she has the rope at the other end of the kitchen and she says, don't move, don't move. And then she goes into tug of war mode. And this other sister walks through the kitchen. Actually, she was walking past the door of the kitchen. Older sister, lovely lady. She had just come home from work. She'd been, you know, all day long at this difficult task that she does, and I expected her to keep on going. No, she joined Sister Magda on the other side of the tug of war line, right? And I, I was laughing so hard, I thought, you know, when I woke up today, I never imagined tug of war with Polish nuns. I just wasn't <laughs> seeing it, right? So, the, the one, Sister Magda was practicing because she has a big youth ministry thing coming up down in South Jersey, and she was practicing her tug-of-war skills, and she wants to teach the kids what's really... And there's a lot more skill to tug-of-war than you think, right? And I, I, I was laughing so hard, and so, like, not ready for this. They gave two big tugs, and I thought, oh, I, I, think, I think they're going to get me. I think they're going to get me. So I remembered the old trick. What do you do when you're about to lose tug-of-war? <laughs> Let go. <laughs> and there was this big tumble of blue fabric all over the kitchen and going in the other directions, right? And everybody, the sisters were on the floor, I was on the floor. Everybody was laughing so hard that nobody could speak. Nobody, I mean, it was just gut-wrenching laughter. It was, it was hilarious. It was great fun. What's it got to do with the Good Shepherd? It's that nun in the background, the one who was going to walk past and it had enough going on all day and thinking, uh, I'm just going to keep going and let sister lose her tug of war game. But no, she had to make a choice there. And it was a fun choice. And she made the choice to help out. She made the choice at a moment when she might want to had just to go and you know, put her feet up and have another cup of chamomile in the other room. She leapt into the fray. And because of it, 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 it just beautiful things ensued. I mean, I lost and I have to take the hit for that one, but I'm going to practice this week. <laughs> Anybody wants to help me after Mass, good, let me give me a tug of war <laughs> lessons. But when Sister, I think Sister Irene, decided that she was going to help, that's, that's the big difference. So, it's the choice between selfish and selfless. Even at a moment when she thought, okay, let's just, put a, let's just go sit down for a couple of minutes, or should I jump in and help? Friends, when it comes to the Good Shepherd Gospel, one of the stark contrasts seems to be between the good shepherd and the hired hand. The good shepherd who keeps the community together, the hired hand who really doesn't care. But there's another way of looking at it, and that is that each one of us makes the choice all the time between being the good shepherd and being the wolf, right? Forget the hired hand for a second. It's about being the wolf. That is the person who indulges self-interest, 
who doesn't want to take that next step on behalf of the community and its well-being? The wolf is the one who's so concerned about me that the wolf never asks about us. What's in it for me rather than what's best for us? And the ultimate wolf, at the time that these things were being written, Luke in about probably both of these things, let's just say, around 90 AD, in Acts of the Apostles and in the Gospel, the ultimate, the ultimate wolf is Caiaphas. Caiaphas, who was related to whom? What was the other guy's name, the other high priest? Annas, remember from, from Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Annas and Caiaphas. Annas is the father-in-law, Caiaphas the son-in-law. Annas had five sons and a daughter. Caiaphas married the daughter, but between the, the six of them and the father-in-law, they occupied the high priest position for something like 38 out of the 48 years, starting in the year uh, 12 AD. So from 12 AD to about 60 or 65, I think it was, that family was, on the, was occupying the high priest position, and it was a cushy deal. It was really a nice setup if you could get it. And Caiaphas himself was the high priest for 18 years. And you don't get to be high priest for 18 years by thinking about everybody else all the time. It's one of those strategic jobs where you have to be thinking about, wow, how can I protect my self-interest? Given the choice between me and us, Caiaphas would always go with me. And so in the first reading today, Peter is addressing Caiaphas in the background here. Peter has healed the guy with the disability. Peter and John have been told not to preach about this, not to, not, not to use the name of Jesus. And in ordering them not to preach about Jesus, Caiaphas clearly doesn't want anybody going over to the other side. Caiaphas can't handle the news of the resurrection. He can't handle the truth. I think I should put that in a movie. You can't handle the truth. Caiaphas can't deal with it. Caiaphas is always about, wait, if that word gets out, what's going to happen to me? It's not about what's good for us, it's about me. And so Peter says to Caiaphas, who's just ordered him not to speak, you know, what are we going to do? Not speak about Jesus because you told us to? Forget it, Caiaphas. This is the one you crucified. So if we're not going to give up talking about him just because you want to you, you want to protect your own game. Not going to happen. And so Caiaphas is that wolf who's always trying to bust up the community to maintain his position in it. He's not the good shepherd. He's a bad shepherd. Well, it's not just a hired hand. He's the wolf who breaks up the community. Because he's always so interested in himself, he can't start to think about what's good for us. Jesus, in the gospel today, there are four players in it, and we occupy all of those roles at different times. We are the sheep. We can be the wolf. We can be the hired hand. And we can't ever be the good shepherd, but we can be a good shepherd. But once again, the trade-off is between the shepherd, the good shepherd, a good shepherd, and the wolf. What does the wolf do when the wolf comes and attacks the, 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 the group? What does the wolf do? Catches and scatters, right? Destroys the individual, destroys the community so that everybody's running in his or her own direction. Destroy the individual, catch it, chew it up, or destroy the community, make it scatter. And so Caiaphas has a big hand in making the early community, the church community scatter. That's what he did, right? And so we heard about it in Acts of the Apostles during the week, this week, that what Caiaphas did, doesn't mention him by name, but he engineered the attack on the Christian community precisely to break it up. Why did he do it? Because he's a wolf. Because he wanted to bust up the community, because if the community stayed as a community, he'd be losing traction, he'd be losing position, both with the Jews and with the Romans. And so Jesus gives us the example that he is the one who never asks about me. Jesus is always asking what's good for us. And when Jesus tells us he's going to lay down his life for us, that's a good shepherd move in two ways. On the earthly realm, Jesus laying down his life for us gives us a supreme example of someone saying what's good for us. And Jesus knowing that only by laying down his life for us would the doors of heaven be open. And so he gives himself as the sacrifice for us. If he'd been in it for me, he would have hightailed it over to Jordan and they never would have seen him again. 
And the other thing that Jesus does is he brings the entire flock together, and he's talking almost about universal appeal of the gospel. There are sheep who do not belong to this fold, but they're my sheep as well. And I go along with the people who think that maybe he's talking about heaven, ultimately. That he wants to bring all people to heaven. He wants to have that ultimate flock where there is no wolf and where there is no hired hand. And so he gives us the perfect example of the good shepherd, and we try to imitate him, each one of us, as a good shepherd. And we have the choice probably between being a good shepherd who maintains the community and the good shepherd, I'm sorry, a good shepherd who upholds the community and the wolf who busts it up. The wolf who's always asking selfish questions. The wolf who fails to ask questions about what the other needs. And so we find that, that trade-off. We find that little bit of a tension in our lives between wanting to imitate Christ as a good shepherd and building up the community and being a wolf who busts it up. Maybe not deliberately, maybe just secondary. Maybe it's a, an externality, an unexpected outcome of my selfish behavior. It busts up the community. Friends, I, I guess most pastors feel the same way, that they're, they're blessed with the presence of people who are continually giving great examples of what it means to be a Christian as you continually provide great examples of what it means to be a Christian. And every one of you, I mean, it would be fun to go through and just say, this is why you're a good shepherd, and here's 10 reasons why you're a good shepherd, and here's 15 reasons why you are good shepherds, and you, okay, own it. That's God's grace. In those moments when you had the choice to think about me or to think about us, you chose us. In those moments when you could have done something for your own enrichment, whether it's time or whether it's prestige or whether it's something else, you decided to go for the us. What's in it for us? What's the best choice for us? It's your family. It's your congregation. It's your friends at work. It's your colleagues. It's your team. It's your study mates at school. It's 101 different groups to which you belong where you have said, wow, what should I do in this situation? And it's important to keep an eye on what's in it for us. You've been a good shepherd. You are good shepherds. You will be good shepherds. Not the good shepherd, but you are a good shepherd who's continually working for the well-being of others and the community. And each one of us, by virtue of our human nature, has a share in the wolf's voice. There's that wolf that is always sitting on the shoulder, right, just like the serpent. There's that wolf that wants to say to us, you know what, forget about them. Think about you for a minute here. And we have to do that. We can get neurotic. We can go right over the edge being too concerned about saving the world. It's not our job. But we can also get very carried away with what's in it for me. So notice, what are two or three of the habits where you really are a good shepherd, where it might be easier for you to be a cheap shepherd and run for the hills, but no, you're, you're really dedicated to this community. And what's one way you acknowledge whether or not you act on it, but you're tempted toward it, where you are the wolf who maybe just badmouths people who aren't there a lot and runs down the community that way? It doesn't help. Maybe there's a way in which you just want to say, forget it, I'm not going to take, I, act on my responsibility to this group. Who knows what it is for you? It could be an addiction, it could be a preoccupation, it could be anything, but there's that one wolfish voice in you and in me. Three or four ways in which you are a good shepherd. One way in which you're tempted to be a wolf. And that story certainly would have turned out differently if sister had just kept on walking past the kitchen, huh? But she was a good shepherd, just like you. <clears throat> so it's those choices that we run into, and you, I, I know that you solve most of them on the f in favor of being a good shepherd and imitating the good shepherd. Asking about what's good for us rather than what's in it for me. 
You do that when you do your homework early and you get the laundry put away and you empty the dishwasher. You do that in the way that you treat strangers. You do that in the way you commit yourself to people who are living at the edge. You do it in all sorts of ways. So name three or four ways in which you really are a good shepherd and don't take it for granted because that grace is from God. And one way, perhaps, in which you're, you know, you're tempted by the wolf. You might sound like a wolf sometimes. You might talk like a wolf. And you need to get God's grace to chase the wolf away. Let us pray.